Ba -da -ba -ba -da. Hey, and welcome to the Heat Spring video with Bill Brooks, the guy that coined the term rapid shutdown. This is a video that we're getting a little bit extra silly on, but also you're going to learn a lot here, and perhaps the silliness helps the education sink into your brain so you don't fall asleep. Enjoy. I just wanted to show you how lucky you are to be in this course and to hear from Bill Brooks about Rapid Shutdown. And we can see that here was a webinar on Rapid Shutdown and they just talk about how great he is. And it says that he's been doing this for like 30 years. He's written all these technical manuals, international codes, all these UL standards, and he is on code making panel number four of the National Electrical Code. So what I did here is I just Googled Bill Brooks invented solar and look at that. Apparently he must have invented solar because look what pops up here, our book. PV and the NEC. Do you have that? I hope so. Okay, so this, this, this is very serious here because Bill is on code making panel four. And they were having a very heavy discussion there about fire safety with the National Fire Protection Association. And Bill came up with the term, rapid shutdown. <laughs> and so there was this battle of the bands, another very serious thing going on in San Francisco. And one of these companies had a band called the Rapid Shutdowns. So Bill had to go take credit for naming their band, unknown to them who named their band. And so they gave you that shirt, I guess they got it. I borrowed it from him for the picture right uh -huh. there. I said, so, okay, I, I'm, I'm wearing your shirt. So I took his shirt off. They didn't let you wear the, the boa or the fuzzy thing? Oh, I did that too. Uh -huh. But that's not, uh, uh -huh. we, ha we have no photo evidence uh -huh. of that. Yeah. <laughs> and so there he is. It's, it's, it's the back of the shirt. This so is wingman. Is that a compliant label? Is, is it supposed to be on the back side or is it supposed to well, be? Well, it just has to be adjacent to uh -huh. the shutdown. Yeah. Okay. So well. it's going to be at the service entrance. So I guess I'm a service entrance there. Yeah. It looks like you're at the entrance of that place. I'm there. equipped with rapid shutdown. Yeah. I can shut stuff down in a hurry hmm. with my jokes. Yeah. Six ninety dot twelve. There it is, people. All right. You saw it here first. That was the battle of the bands. All right. Let's jump into it. Let's talk about six ninety dot twelve. Jumping in, we're gonna. Oh, that's that's what we call fire yeah. porn right there. Yeah, and that, that's another thing that you do too. You're like an expert witness for. Um, fires for buildings that have PV on them and stuff like that. Well, I've done. I've been involved in fire investigations. That would be the correct way to say that. And occasionally, those become legal matters. Often, kind of hint of, or people say that they're going to become legal matters. So that you try to figure out what's going on before they become a big legal fight. Fires around buildings in particular are somewhat problematic and insurance companies are involved and lawyers are involved and everybody wants to know what happened. And so I've been involved in maybe 30 uh, fire investigations over the last 10 or 15 years. You learn about what happens and what can happen and you hear people's stories about what they think happen. And I've been in many fire investigations where what they thought happened really didn't happen. And we found out the real reason for it. But PV has definitely started a few fires, unfortunately. So is it sort of like those crime scene investigation movies? CSI? Absolutely. CSI. It's actually one of the funnest things that I do. Not that I like to see fires around PV systems. That's not what I like to see. But it's good to know what causes fires so you can talk about and work on requirements that will reduce those hazards or reduce the likelihood of those things happening in the future. And certainly 690.12, although it's not explicitly designed to prevent fires, it's to make it so that firefighters are more willing to fight fires on buildings with PV because PV doesn't normally cause fires on buildings. That's a very rare occurrence. Like I said, I've maybe been in 30 investigations, which is still a very small number. The number of building fires that happen a year are astronomically larger than that. Occasionally, we have situations where there's a fire on a building that has PV, and then rapid shutdown was really intended to be a way of controlling or shutting down sources that we didn't have control over in the past. Initially, back in 2008, 
the fire service was proposing that we put a rooftop disconnect on everybody's home. That became a proposal to the fire code. And I got involved at that point to discourage them from putting that regulation in because generally the way PV systems are built, a disconnecting means just in the DC circuit is not going to actually shut the power off at all. Still have power on both sides of the switch in many cases. There's a lot of history. I think it is helpful to for people to understand where this stuff comes from because there's enormous numbers of conspiracy theories on how this happened. You know, this was a big end phase or solar edge ploy to sell more product and all that kind of stuff. And from an outsider who knows nothing about what's going on, it may have that uh, visibility or looks like that from the outside, but that's just absolutely not it true. Would, it would probably sell TV shows on the History Channel, like Ancient Aliens or something. That's right, yeah. So Ancient Aliens, that that's about as accurate as Enphase was involved in making this happen. Ancient Aliens dreamed up rapid shutdown, and they implanted those words in my brain while I was sleeping and forced me to say them in the code panel meeting. That's uh-huh. probably... Uh, you know, I always tell people that we stole the PV technology off the ship that landed at Area 51 because oh, yeah. if you look at the timeline, it was just a few years later that... Yeah, it's a little, know, little too close. A so. little too close. So, yeah, I'm with you on that. And Velcro, too, you know, you've seen... Was aliens behind that? Yeah, absolutely. Damn. Anyway, a really important part of the title here is that it's for rapid shutdown of PV systems on buildings. Buildings are loosely defined in the electrical code and it means enclosed structures that have firewalls and things like that it wouldn't include open structures and all for those of you who watch some of the stuff about fire setbacks and all there's exemptions in there for those open structures so this is intended to be enclosed buildings where the fire service might have to not only ventilate the roof maybe that might be one option or actually rescue people from inside and if the building doesn't need either of those things then rapid shutdown really has no benefit it's a possibility of actually getting an exemption from the fire service on this particular item if the fire service determines that a building there is never going to be a reason to rescue someone from the building uh, or even animals maybe it's just a, a shed for instance then rapid shutdown might not be necessary and one exception that specifically explicitly in the nec is buildings that are used to house pv system equipment this is typically for large-scale systems where we might use an enclosure for indoor rated inverters or switch gear things like that and that's the only reason there's an enclosure it's there's no office space there there's no anything that would be something that would cause somebody to occupy that building It would only be for maintenance purposes that any human being would be inside the building. They're exempted from that, which is a really important exemption because a lot of your large-scale facilities have these buildings that house inverters. And if they were required to meet rapid shutdown, that would defeat the purpose of... I, I met this guy at SNEC, the big conference in China, and he was saying that he did like five gigawatts that year. He, th- he thought he was a small developer. Right. But he showed us this picture that pretty much had an aircraft control tower like structure in the middle of his solar farm that they would just bring people up there to overlook and see all the PV. You know, it's a good way to look at all your PV. Mm-hmm. How would that comply with rapid shutdown? Like, would you need to have. Well, you're not going to put any PV on that structure. Yeah. But so, some conductors went through there or something. Yeah, you wouldn't want to put conductors through there. So, yeah, yeah what, observation what? towers, things like that. You know, that's not going to be something where uh, PV conductors are located mm-hmm. anyway. So let's talk about controlled conductors. And that's one foot from the array in all directions. The array boundary is going to be the edge of the solar panels or the edge of the mounting hardware that holds the solar panels onto the roof. And then it's also gives additional information that if you have a piece of equipment that's in that one foot boundary, then that piece of equipment could be a combiner box, could be an inverter, a junction box or something like that. That becomes part of the array if portion of it is in that one foot boundary. 
Uh, just portion of it, so like just barely on the line. That's right. That's right. And the intention there is just that you're putting equipment right next to the array to deal with your wiring or actually inverting or whatever. Uh, it's intended to be part of the array and becomes part of that boundary. And that means that the rules inside the boundary are slightly different than the rules outside the boundary. And if you didn't have that stipulation, then you'd force everybody to put their boxes and everything underneath the solar panels which can be a real pain in the neck and not very good for maintenance or O&M and things like that. So that's why that provision so, is there. So if you had a one foot box that was 11 inches away from the array, that counts? Absolutely. It's sort of like the NFL maybe or something like that? Could be, yeah. You gotta, gotta break the plane or something. I don't know. You're barely um, stepping on the line. Is it? Yeah, yeah. So inbounds and out of bounds. So that's the boundary. So inside the array boundary has requirements that are in B2, B1, which are the conductors outside the array, have more stringent requirements for controlled conductors outside the array. So B1 basically says that you've got to be down to 30 volts within 30 seconds if you're more than one foot outside that array boundary. That's important. Let's say you had rows of solar panels or PV modules. For those of us important people, we call them PV modules. If your rows are more than two feet apart, then you're gonna have a section of your conductors that are going to be more than a foot from the array boundary. And then you'd have to figure out how you're gonna deal with that. One way would be to put a box or something in between or, or even put a dummy panel in between. Uh, some people have done that. Or you'd have to shut down your conductors to that 30 volts within 30 seconds in order to comply. So those are the things that you have to think about when you don't have a contiguous array. So you could build an array that say 150 feet by 150 feet, completely contiguous, where each module is no more than two feet from the next module, and that becomes a one big block. So the rules for inside the array boundary would apply to that entire 150 foot by 150 foot area. But if you start breaking it up, then you've got different rules. So you've got rules inside the array and you've got rules outside the array. This is the outside the array rules. And the voltage is measured between any two conductors and any conductor in ground. And it's going to be the highest voltage. And when we mention the word voltage, what we mean, if it's on the DC side, voltage is defined by 690.7. So we're going to go back to 690.7 and we're going to see what we what we mean by voltage and that voltage would be dependent upon whether it's a PV circuit, a DC to DC converter circuit or the like. And if it's an AC voltage then it's going to be whatever the nominal AC voltage is. I got an idea. So you're saying that if you had a big old junction box that was 11 inches away from the array and then you had another array that was four feet away from that other array, but then the junction boxes were within two feet from each other. And then you had some conduit running between those junction boxes. Does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the box becomes part of the array. And so then that one foot boundary goes around that box. And so if you had mm -hmm. another box it would have to be two feet or less. So don't make mm -hmm. it 25 mm -hmm. inches. You screwed up, you know, you would want to be 23 and a half inches apart. Mm -hmm. Then that just continues the array. That's a lot of trouble to go to uh -huh. if it's not just like once or twice happening on your route. If this yeah. is happening every other row, then you might want to think about a different uh -huh. design or something like that. That's always weird, just figuring out like weird exceptions. So what if you had just stepping stones, like just a junction box, a junction box, and they're each less than two feet from each other? Yeah, it sounds very expensive and, it and would, difficult. It would technically... You could do it. That's right. You could. Or if somebody came out with a really long, narrow junction box. There you go. Just called a gutter. Okay, yeah. you could run a gutter between instead of a conduit. Oh, so you go. could run a gutter 20 yeah. feet and that works? Well, yeah. You could do that. Oh, that's really good to know. Gutters are expensive though. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. these are all trade-offs. I know, I've um, lived there before. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> Sean's, Sean's our neighborhood <laughs> homeless person, but anyway. If you want somebody who knows the streets, <laughs> go to Sean. <laughs> anyway. Maybe I should shave. <laughs> that's right. Wolfman Jack. All right. And you have just completed part one of Rapid Shutdown. We got through outside of the array boundary, and part two of Rapid Shutdown with Bill Brooks will be inside the array boundary, like module level Rapid Shutdown. And one last thing before we go. You can go to solarshawn.com and learn from Sean's podcasts and links. Da -da 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 -da.
Bar, 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 bar.